Hello and let's talk about COVID-19 in India. We are now the country with the second highest number of cases in the world at close to 4.3 million. We also have recorded over 72,500 deaths. Yesterday's number of new cases was in the mid 70,000s after a few days of massive surges, but there is really no sign of the crisis abating. Meanwhile, like we almost got tired of saying, there is not a peak from the government regarding how it intends to deal with this crisis. News Clicks Prabir Purkayastha talks about where we are at right now and how we got here. The disturbing part about the India's growth, and if you look at the India's charts which we have on NewsClick, for example, you will see the graph of new cases or the graph of total cases, what is called as a, basically the slope. It shows you the speed at which the epidemic is developing. In India has been constant for the last three to four months. Right. But that is surprising because most countries either because of natural reasons, that means the pool of infected people burn out because the numbers of people already in that area have been infected. And then it looks for new areas to spread. And they can get a, in that sense, an interregnum before it takes off again. So you get this, this kind of figures, if like in, the, like in Brazil, for instance, where you really have no uh, measure the government seems to have taken. People have taken measures. They have social distance themselves. They're using masks. The government has done nothing. So in that cases, you do find that after some time, still the epidemic starts to slow down. In other places, because of the lockdown, the slowdown takes place. In the US, as we know, we have had a muddled policy, sometimes on, sometimes off, initially off, a completely muddled response by the US government. The public public health system has been in shambles, all of that we know. And that has led to slowing down, increase, slowing down, increase as a cycle. And as you can see, US, now if you look at the map, you'll find new areas coming under the, uh, the grip of the epidemic. India, on the other hand, which had a very draconian lockdown, it's interesting, it didn't serve any purpose, except of course, destroying the productive forces of the economy. So you don't see in India any impact of the lockdown because it was premature. There was no preparedness for the lockdown. That is, it explains why India has had the biggest hit to the economy of any of the large economies. If you take the large 20 economies of the world, what's called the G20, you'll find India's GDP drop is the sharpest. That's also because India made no preparation for the lockdown, imposed a lockdown without any warning. And that, that is why the economy took a big hit. At that time, when the lockdown was imposed, India had only about 600 odd cases. Right. So it is also a completely premature lockdown in the belief that we'll be able to crush the epidemic completely. What they didn't realize is that in order to do that, you need really a good system by which you can identify who are the people infected? At that stage, right. people were really uh, coming in from outside who are infected and interdict them, stop the d disease further by isolating them, quarantining them, and of course, treating them, and also completely contact tracing. It was manageable at that stage without such a draconian lockdown. Right. Instead of that, the lockdown meant that we focused, on the other hand, how to stop people from meeting each other, how to impose a lockdown, how to get food to people, all the paraphernalia which a lockdown requires for right. a state to deliver, focus was really on that. So instead of really the focus being on what should have been, which is how at the initial stage to look at the people who are coming from outside who could be infected and stopping that. And don't forget, India has close connections to West Asia. It has close connections to Southeast Asia and also to the United States and Europe. So you had various sources of people coming in, not many from China. So this were the sources to which infections did arrive. And if you could have focused on that in the first three months, maybe the economy would not have taken such a big hit. Instead of that, we closed the economy down. It didn't help. The economy not only suffered, but even the quarantining of the people, all those measures failed because at the end of it, people had to go home to eat, eat right. their families had to survive. Right. So essentially the lockdown became porous. And therefore the purpose of the lockdown, when the infection started to increase, that is the time when the purpose of the lockdown was defeated. As a consequence, 
the lockdown served very little purpose in terms of stopping the epidemic. Mm -hmm. And now we are in various phases of unlockdown. We are calling it the unlockdown four, by which even the metros will start, for instance, in Delhi. Once we do that, that you can see the epidemic, which Delhi had started to come down again, going up. Right. So you are starting to see a repeat surge after the you know, various measures were taken that it came down, it's also starting to go up again. So it simply shows that there does not seem to be a thinking in the government how to combine health, economy, society, all of it together. And the three months, four months of the lockdown, unlockdown, as we call it, sequence that we have built in this, the health stretch system, which needed to be strengthened, does not seem to have strength, been strengthened. We find, for instance, ventilators not available in district towns, in other uh, states, which are relatively economically poorer. In those places, these things don't seem to be there. So the strengthening of the public health system, which should have been attempted in this period, was also not possible because you're under a lockdown. Right. So all your focus was really the lockdown, how to do that. So we decided there is only one instrument to solve the problem of the epidemic, the police lockdown. And we did not regard it as a public health issue, as a public health system, and how to involve the state, the local governments, and the central government, work out a policy that also includes the people. Instead of that, we had a completely alienating police approach to the problem. And as we see, the draconian lockdown was also a very porous lockdown. We suffered on both counts. And at the moment, we don't seem to have any weapons in our hands to stop the epidemic. So we now we are asking the police again to impose masks and other things. And of course, police is imposing this. You can see car drivers being hauled up for not having masks. Now, the reason perhaps is that they will at least pay the fines. That goes into the police funds as well. So as a consequence, it may fund the police partially, but it doesn't really mean much to the rest of the infection exactly. spreading people. In our next segment, we bring you a conversation between writer Vijay Prashad and musician Roger Waters. They're talking about the trial of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and some of the issues around it. The extradition hearing for Assange resumed yesterday. He's being punished and persecuted for exposing US war crimes. He faces charges under the Espionage Act in the US. And this is the first time a publisher and a journalist is being hounded this way. If he's extradited and if he's convicted in the US, he faces up to 175 years in prison for the crime of telling the truth. Vijay Prashad and Roger Waters discuss some of the issues around the case, as well as the state of the media in the US and around the world. The thing is a complete charade. That is what, this is my exasperation, is that you cannot have the conversation because you can have it till you're blue in the face. Julian's partner, Nor Sarah Norris is it, and his father and his brother and his, you know, this... Icelandic guy who runs WikiLeaks now. We, mar we marched down Whitehall with, with all these good people. Um, but we could march up and down Whitehall till we were blue in the face. And they would still say, they, would, they, they try and brush us off as if we're insects, you know, that are irritating their skin. Our voices are so ill heard. And, and the sad thing is that now that they've discovered that Orwell was right. And if you give enough power to the Ministry of Truth, and if you exercise your right to own all the newspapers and to deliver your propaganda and all the television stations and everything, because you're wealthy, because you're the ruling class, so you can buy all ways of disseminating in information, then you can provide um, propaganda that is... Um, to, to which there is almost no resistance. You have no idea, PJ, how many people I meet who are friends of mine, who I've known for 25, 30, 40, 50 years, who come out at me with things and I go, whoa, oh, whoa, what are you talking about? I had a great friend, I won't mention his name. I spoke to him on the phone two days ago because I wouldn't want to embarrass me. Because he was saying, I'm really worried. I may have to leave, leave the United States. It's so frightening. Trump this and Trump that and the other and blah, blah, blah. And then he went, you know, if you think about it and you think that 
um, it, the Russians hacking the bar and meddling in the in the 2016 election got this guy, um, you know, and he's in bed with him. I went, whoa! I nearly said his name there, but whoa, X, shut the f up! Don't tell me that you bought the Russia Gate nonsense. I are you insane? What on earth makes you think any of that is relevant in any way? And have you not noticed that at the DNC National Convention, nobody mentions Russia, okay? not a single word, because they all know it's complete bullshit. It was just a way of wasting time so that nobody who has questions to ask about the judicial system, about Assange, about Chelsea, about the whole crazed way that the deck is loaded so that no truth is allowed to escape at any point. And you, my friend, have bought into it by listening to Rachel Maddow on MSNBC banging on about Russiagate. That's just her way of saying, you know, Hillary was right to take money from Wall Street. And she, and then what's wrong with being a born in the game? of the real, the real people are the people who have all the money, who buy everything. And so don't, you know, and this is the Overton window. He said, what? The Overton window. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. It's a bit like nobody, when I say, um, I talk about the Patriot Act to American citizens. And I talk about um, amendments to it, 1021 and 1022. Duh. What are you talking about? And I said, well, you can, you, anybody, if they, if Donald Trump thinks that you might be helping a terrorist organization, you can be arrested and locked up forever. No phone call, no lawyer, no nothing. Just because he thinks you might be. And they go, what? And I go, you see, you don't know, they don't even know that 1021 and 1022 are on the statute books and are the law of the land. Nobody gives and that's bizarre beyond all belief. They don't care that they're completely enslaved. And people have various theories about that. My theory is that the theory, this is the theory that's right, is they're so close to being homeless that they're clutching desperately at straws. And the straw that they grip to most often is, it's the blacks, it's the Muslims, it's the Chinese. It's, that's the easiest propaganda to sell them. <sighs> Oh, thank God, I found a straw. I don't need to know the truth. I don't need the collateral murder videos. I don't need Assange. I don't need B.J. Prashad. I don't need the Tricontinental Institute. I don't need Roger Woods. I don't need anybody to try and help me out of this bog that I'm drowning in. I'm fine. It's them. Trump is right. You know, and unfortunately, somehow that gives them comfort, even though the next week they do get thrown out on the street. They are homeless. They are one of the 25% of the homeless who are veterans with no arms and legs who get no help from the VA and the this and that and the other, who kill themselves, you know, faster than any of us can possibly imagine because life carrying the burden of guilt is so desperate and they're not getting help they're not getting the help that they would need from any society that gave a shit about oh we love our boys our heroes from the they say that but they the people of this country don't give a about them because if they did they would force the government they would force the rich people to look after them Say, welcome home, brother. Oh, Jesus, you're up. Here, what can we do for you? We need to organize. We need meetings. We need, and you need money. We need to support you financially. You can't be homeless. Mm -hmm. You can't be homeless on the street. You're damaged. But the attitude is, oh, you, you know, you're cannon fodder, and we don't need you anymore, so screw you. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from the country and the world. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.